Hi there. In the second week of the course, we looked at research into terrorism and research into counterterrorism. And we observed that there are too few non-Western scholars from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and that there is a lot of attention to terrorism in the West or against the West or Western interests, and far less attention to terrorism elsewhere. Well, if we look at the map of terrorist incidents worldwide, we know that most terrorism takes place outside the Western world. Um, also regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, countries like Niger, Nigeria, uh, and Chad. And this is also known as the uh, Lake Chad Basin. Well, I'm very happy um, uh, to introduce to you Dr. Akinola Olojo, a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies based in Dakar, uh, Senegal, who is also involved in a research project into uh, terrorism in uh, the Lake Chad Basin. So welcome, Dr. Alojo. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very interested in your research uh, project. Could you tell us a little bit more about the groups, um, the terrorist groups, or the aspects of terrorism that you're focusing upon? No, thanks very much once again. Um, it's nice to be reconnected on this platform. Um, so that's a very uh, important question, and I'll respond um, in a number of ways. Um, first, um, I think it's important that we get a sense of uh, the trends as well as the spaces affected by these trends. And then, of course, taking a look at the actors or the groups implicated uh, in, in some of these trends across the continent of Africa. And perhaps to also um, provide a sense of uh, the kind of responses and interventions we've seen so far. And of course, that ties in uh, with some of the research and, and work we've done. Um, so in terms of the trends, over the last few years, um, we've seen quite a number of attacks uh, occur in the Sahel, uh, in countries like Mali, Burkina Faso. Um, if we look to the Lake Chad Basin, which you rightly uh, hinted at earlier, countries like Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, we've seen quite a number of attacks there as well. Um, if we move to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we've seen uh, attacks also occur. Um, the East and the Horn of Africa, we've seen countries like Kenya, like Somalia, and even most recently Uganda in 2021, affected by terrorism. And then, of course, we've seen also unfolding trends uh, in countries like Mozambique. Now, beyond these trends, uh, we've also seen that there are certain groups, um, quite a number of them, that have been implicated in these attacks and a few of them, which I'll just mention very quickly, just to remind us of what we already know. Um, in the Lake Chad Basin, for instance, we've seen affiliates of the so-called Islamic State West, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Islamic State West Africa province, and that's what it calls itself. We've seen um, factions of Boko Haram, such as the Jamatu al-Sunna Lidawati wal Jihad. We've seen in the wider Sahel, um, what we know as the JNIM, and also the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, and if you look back again at you know, the Eastern Horn of Africa in countries like Somalia, we've seen Al-Shabaab, which many of us might recall since 2012, pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Now we've seen all this happen, all these groups emerge, but then we've also seen responses trying to sort of uh, you know, uh, match some of these uh, attacks or address some of these challenges in these countries or regions. And I think it's helpful that we acknowledge some of them, you know, beyond the narratives of violence. Um, we've also learned lessons because some of these countries have crossed thresholds and we've seen how attempts have been made to address these challenges. So for example, in the Sahel, we've seen uh, what is known as the G5 Sahel Joint Force. We've seen, of course, what is known as the African Union mission in Somalia, AMISOM. And we've also witnessed what is known as the regional strategy for stabilization, recovery, and resilience for the Boko Haram affected areas in the Lake Chad Basin. It's called the RSS. It's a very long acronym. Now, and are, are these groups of countries that, that work together? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. It's a coalition of countries. So mm -hmm. the last one I mentioned, which is the RSS, yeah. is one which is inspired by the Lake Chad Basin Commission, but it's also supported by the African Union. So I think beyond this, uh, you know, these trends or these points, um, at the Institute for Security Studies, for example, that I work with, um, we highlight not only these trends because we're dealing with a rapidly shifting landscape of, of crisis, but then we do it in a timely way. Mm 
And a number of key themes we've sort of um, had attention drawn to have included, for instance, disarmament, demobilization, rehabilitation and reintegration of former fighters. Uh, we've taken a look at um, questions around economies of violence or war economies. We've taken a look at um, what we refer to as community resilience, because I think that is really key. Um, we've also most recently um, actually launched uh, a report uh, which is focused on exploring transitional justice. In other words, how can communities that are affected by these, you know, these challenges, in what ways can the tools of transitional justice apply to them and how do we address this in the context of violent extremism? So I think these are very key aspects which um, are really important for us to take into account. And I think moving forward, there's a lot to really reflect on uh, as we discuss. You looked at, at many different uh, African countries. I know in, in the past you did a lot of research on the Horn of Africa. I know you focus more a bit more about uh, Western Africa and the, the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, but the type of reactions that you describe, the coalitions, um, the, the countries, but also their different measures, is there something like an, an African approach? Is it is it different? Well, how, how are these different? Are there differences between the countries? And I know you've done also a lot of research um, in France and also here in the Netherlands. Uh, so you're also familiar with, with approaches worldwide. Is there something distinct about um, the way African countries deal with these, um, these worrisome trends? Because, well, you mentioned actually quite a few hotspots uh, in, in Africa. No, that's a real subject. Um, it's been in focus for a while. Um, I think I'll probably frame it as there is an African context. So perhaps, I mean, we're dealing with the common enemy here in violent mm -hmm. extremism, terrorism. It affects everyone. I mean, this is why we have what is known as the Global Coalition Against Daesh, for example. And we have countries across regions, across continents that sort of engage in, you know, these spaces or on these platforms. But then the African context is very key. There are nuances and also uh, the need to be sensitive to how um, communities sort of engage in all of this. Um, I think the historical trajectory of most African countries is also one which um, should be taken into account when we reflect on responses. So, for example, when you look at, say, the Lake Chad Basin, um, mm -hmm. when we talk about um, uh, the idea of foreign fighters, for example, um, the idea itself um, even though we tend to understand it as a concept that entails individuals crossing the borders of a country into another country to join battles or to um, you know, fight against the states, even though that sounds like you know, the, the, you know, the standard idea, in the African context, there is a historical uh, you know, sort of trajectory that has shaped our understanding of what is foreign. So you might have individuals who cross the border from, say, Niger to Nigeria, and while they cross state borders, they actually share common heritage mm -hmm. or maybe perhaps a common ethnicity, a common religion, a common historical origin. And that challenges the notion of what we call foreign. And we have actually an analytical um, paper on this, which we published in 20, 2018 you know, at the ISS, which sheds even more light on these nuances. So the African context is very key. And I think it's such an important aspect when we think about how to sort of address some of these challenges. Well, you also discussed uh, communities. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more uh, about that? So in, in, in what way do you look at, at communities? Do you look at victim communities, how they deal with that, or communities uh, at risk to, to produce maybe a terrorism? So how does that uh, concept of communities um, uh, relate to the, the topic that you study? No, this is such an important one. Um, so when we speak of communities, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that communities anywhere on the continent of Africa are the ones who are most affected by the violence we're talking about. So if you think back to October 2017, for instance, in Somalia, we had one of the deadliest terror attacks globally. In a single attack, we had at least 500 individuals who were killed in one attack. So they bear the brunt of most of these, uh, you know, these attacks. But then beyond that, communities understand these problems. They know how to frame them in the way they understand it. And even though they don't use the kind of technical language that you know, researchers or policymakers employ, but I think understanding their perceptions and perspectives, going to meet them, speaking with them, trying to not just 
uh, you know, interview them, but to also collaborate with them, you know, in very creative ways is very important. You now, see them as, as also a role in problem solving, so beyond the state? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. As partners, actually, as, mm -hmm. you know, co-collaborators. And I think something which is very key, you mentioned the word victims. I think um, it's helpful to also look at them, not just as victims, but also as survivors. Uh -huh. So the idea of them actually having survived and shown resilience beyond the narratives of violence that they've experienced, I think is really key. And you know, I mentioned something earlier about transitional justice. So this particular um, prism provides us with the tools that we can actually use to focus even more on communities. So it has this um, sort of community centric um, sort of focus. So rather than looking at just maybe um, those who perpetrate violence or attacks, we're looking at the needs of communities across gender lines, across ethnic lines, across religious lines. So it's really one which is really key. And I think communities are the ones, I mean, we need to understand how they need to be prioritized even in the policy, uh, you know, policy formulation processes. And thank you, Dr. Ologia. I think it's it's very fascinating. I think the African context um, deserves uh, more attention. I think there's things you can learn, especially with regard to communities. Of course, um, also in many Western countries, we look at communities, but very often more as a potential threat rather than part of the uh, solution. So I think that's very helpful. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting interview. Um, I'm sure that uh, the viewers would like to learn more about your research. Um, they can do so uh, by visiting the website of the ISS, uh, a very prestigious uh, research institute and a think tank uh, in Africa, different parts of Africa. You're based in Dakar, uh, but their website uh, I can recommend. So uh, it's ISS Africa dot org so iss africa one word dot org so if you want to learn more about the research of dr ologio thank you very much dr ologio thank you very much for this interview thank you for having me